You're listening to Side Hustle Pro, the podcast that teaches you to build and grow a side hustle from passion project to profitable business. And I'm your host, Nikayla Matthews. So let's get started. Today on the show, I am so excited to welcome my very first guest, Janice Jamila. Janice was most recently Ebony Magazine's digital production manager by day, but she found her true passion when she created I Don't Do Clubs in August of 2011. I Don't Do Clubs is a successful events and lifestyle blog that caters to African-American professionals across the country who love to be out and about, just not in a nightclub. In 2015, Janice also created the popular Must Love Beards Day Party Series and the first ever Black-owned Restaurant Month. Welcome, Janice. Thank you for having me. Of course. So tell us your story about entrepreneurship. Were you exposed to a lot of entrepreneurs as a child? Sure. Uh, my father's actually an entrepreneur. He went to college to be an engineer. He was an engineer at IBM for maybe 15, 20 years, and then he got laid off. Mm. Uh, when I was about in, I guess, fourth grade or so, it was a big layoff at IBM. And a year later, he started his own accounting business called In Town Tax. And it still is running Insta Mountain today. Oh, great. So as a kid, did you ever help him out with the business and, and kind of start to get that business savvy just being around him? Oh, I, didn't, I don't think I ever helped him, really. Well, actually, I did. I, I worked one summer there and I was terrible and he fired <laughs> me. <laughs> but um, um, I think just watching him from the start, like I remember when he first got the office space and I being like, oh, this is it. Because, you know, you think dad's going to have this big building. And it was like a small office in Sun Mountain Village. And then seeing that grow. And then sometimes um, when I didn't go straight home from school, I would go to his office. So I'd be like in the other room and I could hear him talking to clients. And I remember saying like, oh, you're so, you know, you're so mean to your clients. He's like, no, I'm not mean. I'm just telling them the truth. I'm not going to, you know, BS them. And I definitely think that's how I am now with people in business. Like I will just tell you straight what it is. I'm not being rude. I'm going to be direct with you. Right. So yeah, he definitely rubbed off on me. Got it. And so then how did the idea for I Don't Do Clubs get started? Because you you didn't immediately try to be an entrepreneur. You know, you went to college and you looked for roles in media. So tell us a little bit about your career path. Sure. Um, I went to Savannah State University for mass communications. I was in their television production program and I was also in the television production program in high school. So I was dead set on being in television production. But um, when I got to college... I still did television production, but I realized I really didn't like working in groups. I guess I always knew I didn't like working in groups, but it just became more apparent that I did not like having to consult with other people or rely on my success for other people. So I still had the idea of being a television producer through college, after college. I interned at CNN in Atlanta, and my plan was to come back to Atlanta after after graduating and just working at CNN, which was downtown Atlanta, cute little area. I had it all planned out in my head, but of course I didn't get a job. So for the first year after college, I kind of floated. I did a lot of production jobs. I didn't like any of them. I did a little event planning, which I've always liked event planning, but I was more like on the club side, which made me uncomfortable. So um, about a year or so after graduation, my sister-in-law suggested that I move to New York. Um, my brother and her lived in New York. My brother went to Juilliard. So they're like, you know, come visit. Maybe you'll see something that you like. There are a lot of production jobs up here. So I did. So I came to visit. I got a job and as a corporate webcasting producer, which was not what I had intended at all, but it was in production. I learned how to code. I learned like the more of the website end of production, which I did not know anything before I started. Uh -huh. So I did that for several years. I've worked at BET, Scholastic, Hot 97, and now I'm at Ebony. Um, but a month before I started at Ebony, or a few months before I started at Ebony, I was reading a book about blogging just because I wanted to know about it. I had worked at um, a bridal magazine where we worked with a lot of bloggers, mommy bloggers, or just, which you know. Book, uh, which book was that, if you re can recall? Um, called the, the Laws of Blogging by Angel Laws, who is the founder of Concrete Loop. If yes. you remember that pop yes, culture. I remember that. <laughs> that a few years ago. So I, I followed the website and, you know, I was trying to support black people. So I was like, oh, I'll get her book. You know, I want to know what how these bloggers do it all. Like, how can you have this big platform and make money just from kind of sitting in your pajamas all day. So I bought the book and I was reading it. And that same weekend, there was a like a hurricane in New York City and they shut down the subways. So I was like locked in the house all weekend. So I'm reading the book and I come up with the idea for I Don't Do Clubs, primarily because um, in Georgia or in Atlanta, I knew a lot of people. Like I never had problems 
making friends. I was never the new kid. I was I was homecoming queen and things like that. So when I moved to New York, I thought it was going to be very simple to make friends and be out and about, and it wasn't. So I remember just thinking how like lonely it was being in a new city, wanting to go out, wanting to meet new people, and not knowing how. But as the years went on, I became friends with like sorors and you know other people, and I started getting invited to like day parties and brunches and things like that. So at that same time, while I'm reading the book, I'm like, oh, this probably could help someone else out if they're moving to a new city and they want to know about non-club events because I've never liked clubs. Even in college, I would go to them, but I hated going to them. And the idea of going to a club in a big city like New York was just not something I wanted to do. I think a lot of people feel like that. And that's why, you know, especially why your business took off like that. No one wanted to admit it. (laughs) (laughs) And so when did you really feel like I can do this? I can make this idea into a business, like not just a hobby, not just a, uh, you know, a passion project, but really try to develop this into a money, income, um, income driver? Sure. Um, well, I always approach it as a business. Um, after reading the blogging book, I started going to blog conferences and I joined a couple blog ad networks thinking, you know, how can I get, you know, money? Cause I didn't want to do it just for fun. Mm-hmm. Um, but it really wasn't working out for me because a lot of bloggers make their money through sponsored posts. So like, if you're a mommy blogger, you can write about detergent. If you're a fashion blogger, you maybe you're writing about shoes, but I don't do clubs doesn't really have that kind of platform. So maybe um, two years or so in, I was like at my wits end. I just, I was over, I don't do clubs. I probably would have sold the URL for like $10. That's how much (laughs) I was over it. And and, um, I went to this, um, like a a media event, because I work at Ebony. So I was going to media events. And I ran to this other blogger named Joy, and she runs the Fab Empire, which is kind of similar to I don't do clubs, but they do more celebrity events. And... um, She's always been really supportive and just like just a nice person. So I, you know, I was talking to her at the event and she's like, well, how's, you know, I don't do clubs going. And I just like let it all out. I was like, I hate it. Mm-hmm. Like it's, it's worth it. And all everyone wants something from you. They want to pay. You know, I didn't say anything about paying. I was like, they want everything from you. And she was like, well, how much are you charging? And I was like, I'm not charging. And she's like, oh, girl, you have to start <laughs> charging. And I was like, well, people won't pay. You know, the, the, the promoters already have kind of the attitude whenever I ask them like for additional information about their event. And she was like, you're right, they won't pay. And I remember just looking at her like, well, that's not motivational. <laughs> like, why are you telling me <laughs> to charge and then saying they won't pay? And then she said, well, they won't pay at first, but eventually they will. You have to start charging or it's going to, like, run you ragged. Mm-hmm. So the next um, week I, you know, got online and I just started kind of figuring out how I wanted to charge. And initially it was only, I think, maybe $10 to put your event on I Don't Do Clubs. And now it's at 15 and it might go up next year. But um, that's how I was able to kind of keep it going for – it's like, it's my own motivation. Yeah. And then last year I came with the idea from Muscle Love Beards and Black on Restaurant Month, which brought in a lot more money. Got it. And, you know, speaking of sponsors, posts and charging, like, how do you stay true to your brand and, and your your ultimate mission that you first started off with when you start getting approached, you know, to put things on your site and approach with money and offers? Uh, how do you really stay true to your key mission? Well, a lot of people, a lot of club events don't even tr- try to submit their events. To, I don't do clubs. Um, so that's not really a big thing. The only thing I really have to push back on with people is if the flyer has like a naked woman on it, I'm like, that's not going to work. And I also don't put flyers on my site that don't have black people on it. It's a site for black women, well, primarily black women, but black professionals. And if your demographic are black professionals, I'm not sure why there's a white woman in a bikini on your flyer. So that's like the most pushback I do. But I have no problem saying no because. I don't like seeing things like that. And I'm definitely not going to put that on my platform. Got it. Got it. So what were some of the key factors that helped you scale from that initial level where you probably weren't making much because you weren't charging to a serious business? Now, now like serious business territories where like you are making income where you can consider leaving corporate America altogether. Okay. You said what were the steps that took me there? Yeah. Okay. Um, it was really muscle of beards. Um, the muscle of beards idea actually wasn't my idea. I was at brunch with some friends and one of my friends is a guy and he had a beard mm-hmm. and he had put some like weird type of product in it. So it was straight and he's a black man. So we were just making fun of his beard, the whole event. I mean, the whole brunch. And then one of my friends was like, oh, you should throw um, a beard party. And I was like, girl, no, like no one's going to come to that. And I had thrown a couple of events in the past for Island clubs that weren't that successful. Mm-hmm. And I was like, that's just a huge undertaking, you know, and I don't even know like if I could make any money because, you know, most day parties and after work mixers are free. So the idea of like going through all that, getting a venue, 
paying a DJ and not really getting anything but a couple hundred dollars from a bar guarantee just was not appealing to me. But anyway, I came home, I thought about it, and I was like, well, might as well try. So I reached out to a couple of venues. I found this small venue um, in downtown Manhattan, and um, I promoted it really hard, and I got a whole bunch of RCPs, and I was really excited. And then the day before, it snowed. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, great. <laughs> so the day of the event, the power on the block was still kind of out. The credit card machine at the venue wasn't really working. So I was like, great, now I'm going to lose out on this $3,000 bar guarantee, and I'm not going to do event ever again. But I remember um, having some friends work the door and I walked outside to kind of just peek into what was happening. And the line was wrapped around the block. And I was like, oh, my God, like people actually came out in the snow for this party. But it was mostly women. (laughs) So maybe in a room full of 100 or 200 people, it was probably 25 guys. But everybody else was a woman. So after that, I said, "Okay, clearly there's a need for this or people want it. But how can I make it where it's a fun party? Because I don't like going to parties with nothing but women. And I'm sure most women probably feel the same way if they're single and looking for a guy. So I came with the idea to charge women, and that has been great. Um, all the Muscle Beards parties have sold out. We've been in a lot of different cities, and we're branching out into new cities this summer. So that was the first thing that really was like, oh, wow, like I actually could do this full time. Mm-hmm. And then while you were doing all of this now, I am always curious because I struggle with this, just time management and work-life balance. Like I... I I think of myself as a pretty organized person, but no matter how organized you are, like it gets tough to balance work and side hustle. So how are you juggling? I don't do clubs at your full time role during this time. Okay, Um, I'm a morning person, so I can get up around five, five o'clock or six o'clock in the morning without a problem. So that's what I do. I wake up early every morning. I work on I don't do clubs from about maybe six o'clock. Um, to about eight o'clock. And that's when my work for Ebony starts. I start working from home at eight o'clock for Ebony. I go into the office around 11. So between six and like 4.30 in the afternoon, I'm just bouncing back and forth between Ebony work and I don't do clubs work. When I first started out, I was working on the weekend, but then I decided I wanted a life and I can't (laughs) work all the time. So I scale back and I put my out of office on quite often because I feel like if I work really hard Monday through Thursday, I should have Friday through Sunday off. So I just, I think what helped me was finding the balance. Like you can't work all the time. When you are working, be really focused, put your phone down. Don't be on social media, just get it done. So when you're off, you don't have to worry about it. Got it. Got it. Yeah. I've recently, I started using Asana. I've just become a lot more serious about my time. Like, okay, girl, you're going to put this cell phone far away from you and you're not going to look at it until you're done with X task. So I definitely hear you on that. Um, And what about your employer? Like, did you have to um, negotiate that special arrangement or were your hours always like coming to the office at 11, start working from home at eight? Well, on my first boss, we always kind of worked from home in the morning. Like it wasn't like an official rule, Mm -hmm. but the Wi-Fi in the office was so bad. They kind of just let it slide. (laughs) But then um, about a year or so, we're a year or so ago, I got a new boss and there was like negotiations. And I pretty much said like, if you're not going to give me a raise and money, then I, we need to adjust my schedule. Mm-hmm. So I was able to negotiate to have work from 8 a.m. to 4.30. And mm-hmm. we have the type of office where no one's really over your shoulder. So I'm sure they know I'm working. I don't do clubs. I mean, who doesn't know? But they can't really <laughs> say anything because, you know, when I get a request in for production which at ebony.com, I do it. And then I go back to I don't do clubs. Mm-hmm. So I just always make sure that Ebony is done first and that I can squeeze in as much I don't do clubs work as possible. Got it. I mean, I make sure that my work is done so no one can say anything to me about anything, really. Yeah. And I also firmly believe I actually want to write an article about this. I firmly believe that your side hustle is really important to your main hustle. Like a lot of things that I bring to my current role, I learned because I started doing it for my own blog to market myself, to market my blog. And, you know, if I was just twiddling my fingers and waiting for an opportunity to do it at work, um, I might not have done it till way down the line after like 10 more meetings <laughs> and 10 more approvals, you know? So I, I firmly believe that everyone should have a side hustle. Um, anywho. So now you've been, I consider everyone an entrepreneur who started even just a side hustle. Like I think if you're thinking that way, you are, you have an entrepreneurial mindset. So what are some things you wish you knew before becoming an entrepreneur? I think what I messed up doing in the beginning with I Don't Do Clubs was listening to everyone's opinion Mm. and feel everyone's need. 
and not really thinking about what I wanted to do. I, I think I tried to, I know I tried to expand I Don't Do Clubs too quickly. And because everyone was like, oh, bring it to this city, bring it to that city. I hired people that, you know, probably weren't the best people to hire. And then I had to go back and fire people and, you know, restructure a lot. And I should have just focused on New York. And like, if other cities come, then great, they can submit their event, but I'm not going to like divert my attention because someone in my comment section thinks I need to bring it to Alaska or something. (laughs) (laughs) Speaking of challenges. So um, can you talk about your biggest failure? Um, let me think. Well, I mean, I don't don't think it was a public failure, but I felt bad having to fire people. Mm -hmm. And I think that I'm not that great at picking um, employees, which is kind of ironic, but I just think I always like miss key factors. So when I had to go through and fire like the whole team, I mean, the world didn't know about that, but I felt like, wow, like I really dropped the ball because how did I not see all these problems before? Mm. Yeah, you know, I was talking to another entrepreneur about that and she did say that the hardest thing in the world is is hiring people. Like, how do you um, truly figure out who's going to be, who's not putting on their game face and who's actually going to be a good employee? Uh, what have you learned that you can share with um, other, you know, women who will eventually have to hire people? Like, are there any tips or, or good, um, you know, resources or recruiters that you work with? I don't think I've I figured it out, honestly. I haven't had, um, I have like two assistants, but they mainly handle my um, email for like the, I don't do, the Janice that I don't do clubs. I have an assistant for that. And I have an assistant that helps with the submissions, which is pretty much copy and paste. But I don't think I've really figured it out. What I've learned is that maybe instead of, I shouldn't try to hire when I am like, in, like stressful, mm-hmm. when I'm stressed out, when I need someone right now, because I don't speak anyone. And also maybe like having a training period. Because what I noticed with a lot of people that I hire, they start out really well. And then, like, week two, week three, they just kind of throw it away. And I'm just like, well, what happened? Mm-hmm. So maybe maybe not say you're hired right away. Like, let's try this for a month. I'll still pay you. But we're not going to say you're on the team. We're not going to make any announcements. We're not going to, you know, tie you directly to I Don't Do Clubs. Because some people just want the, the, the recognition of being with I Don't Do Clubs. Mm-hmm. So I would do a training session for a month or so before I make someone really a part of the team. Got you. And do you have support in terms of like, we all, iron sharpens, iron sharpens iron. We all need that core inner circle. So who would you say is in your starting five and who are the people that make up your success network? And how did you build that team? Honestly, I don't really think I have that, but that's by choice because when I'm not working on I Don't Do Clubs, I don't want to talk about I Don't Do Clubs. So I value that my friends don't really care about it. And my family, my boyfriend, like they are all kind of like, oh, that's cool. But like, <laughs> it's not <laughs> constant thing because I get asked about I don't do clubs all the time. And I think when I'm off, and I'm able to just like think about regular life things that helps me be more, more strong in my work. Got it. Got it. And so, so what are some of your self-care practices to keep that balance as well? Okay. Um, I put down my phone a lot. (laughs) That's the main thing. I also try not to engage in social media like beef or commenting because it's frustrating when you put up a post and it outlines everything and then someone still feels the need to at you and ask the same question that's already in the post. So I really try hard not to because it works me up. I get into a back and forth and that's not good. Um, I have strict business hours or strict office hours. So at 430, I'm done. Like, I don't care what's going on. There will always be a to-do list. It can wait. I also don't keep my emails on my phone. Mm. So, um, Because even if you can't unsee email. So if I'm out with my friends and someone says there's a typo on their post, like, it's going to be on my mind until I get home and fix it. And that's not how it should be. It can wait. Wow, that's a good one. That is, that's (laughs) a challenge. That, I admire you for that. Taking my emails off my phone. I need to try that. Um, One thing that I do try to practice that I learned is don't, don't, you know, answer, don't click into the email until you're ready to address it. Because then you're just like marking it on red to get back to it later. And it's on your head. Like I only, I've said like two times a day when I really check email. And other than that, I resist the urge to look into the email. Like I might see that's, who sent it to me and what the subject is, but I won't read it until I'm ready to spend time replying. That's, that's a really good, uh, 
to, to that's why I said to you earlier, like email me on this account because right. <laughs> I think about I don't do clubs on my personal account. Like I want all the I don't do clubs information in one place. Mm-hmm. And when I have time to really sit down and like look at my calendar or address the issue, it'll be taken care of completely. Yes. Not just, oh, I start and I forget about it. Right. And I totally got it. I was like, got it. I completely understand that. Um, so speaking of you told us about your morning routine and your daily self-care habits. Um, can you talk about just what you do for motivation and how do you keep yourself productive and motivated when you have frustrating experiences like social media trolls or uh, organizers who are complaining? Um, I always think about the end goal. And now that I'm close to the end goal with like planning to leave my full time job, I think that definitely helped me stay motivated and stay on course. Because my end goal is to make my own schedule. I want to be able to travel when I feel like traveling, work when I feel like not, have an event when I feel like it. And I noticed maybe the year three of I Don't Do Clubs, I always have like vision boards and goal lists. And I remember looking at my goals at the the end of year three, I think it was year three, and like noticing that a lot of things that were on the list I didn't do. And not because I didn't know how to, but because... I, I spent time on social media or I spent time going back and forth or, or trying to do everyone's podcast and everyone's mm-hmm. interview. And I was like, I have to learn to say no, because if I don't say no, Janice will suffer and I don't do clubs will suffer. So that's why I have no problem telling people, you know, I'm not going to do any partnership. I'm not going to do your podcast. You know, I'm sorry. If you want to have a conversation with me, you need, you have to pay. It's consultation now. It's not just buy me coffee. Mm-hmm. And that really helped me reach my goals. Girl, you are preaching to the choir right now because I'm in a place where, well, first of all, thanks for doing my podcast. <laughs> I feel very honored. But also, yeah, but like people that like, you started your blog last month. Right. <laughs> That's not going to help me. And then a lot of times people ask me the same questions over and over. I'm yeah. just like, did you get any of the like 20 articles on me? Right. right. So I just, and it, and it frustrates me. I don't want to be frustrated with the person that's, you know, mm-hmm. trying to get their, their, you know, their blog posts up on, you know, or their, I guess, site views or whatever. But it's like this, it has to benefit me too at this point. Mm-hmm. No, that, that completely makes sense. And even myself, like I am definitely not, you know, people aren't chasing me down, but the, the, even like, you know, the dozen or so requests I'm getting, I'm finding it difficult because I want to, for the next four weeks, for example, hold myself away and just record and edit and get my podcast ready for launch. Like, I don't want to do any coffee chats. And and I'm like, oh, man, I never thought I'd be the one who is like, <laughs> have, have, you know, have emails to respond to and haven't gotten back to people because I would always look at people with the side eye like, <laughs> but I get it now. Like, I completely understand. So it, it's a tricky thing to balance. Um, Sometimes when you're not expecting and it's like all at once, everyone wants a piece, but yeah. you have to kick out what you want. And, and, you know, yeah, the end goal is your business, right? Like you need that to be on point no matter what. So speaking of end goals, now you mentioned, you know, getting ready to leave your full time. How how did you get information, so to speak? Like what ducks did you want to have in a row? What things did you identify needing to have in place before you left and how did you work towards getting there? Well, um, so I guess after I'm trying to, I always try to think of like points of, I don't do clothes, maybe after restaurant month, the first one I said, okay, maybe I can think about leaving Ebony and doing, I don't do clubs, um, full time. But that was just a thought. Like I didn't say it to anybody, just like, you know, okay, maybe this could really happen. But I was like, maybe in a year or maybe in two years or maybe in three years. I didn't really, it was always like way in the future. And I was doing my taxes at the end or getting, gathering my information for my taxes at the end of the year last year to get to my father. And I had an idea of how much I made it out on do clubs. And um, I knew how much I had made from the beard parties because all that money went into like a separate checking account. But there were other things I just didn't really think about. Primarily my PayPal account, which I I handled the transactions for the submission th- for. So I added up everything and I realized that I made more money doing I don't do clubs than working at Ebony. And like, I added it up like five times. Like, you've got to be kidding me. Like, this is not true. And <laughs> it was like Sunday morning, early Sunday morning. I called my mom and she was like, are you sure? I was like, no, I, I did like five times. And that's when I was realized, like, you have to stop putting this off. Like, making more money doing what you want to do than your full-time job, but you need to make a plan to leave because if you're, you can, you're probably only going to make more money. So why are you staying pulled to some 
job just for benefits that you can afford yourself now. So what I started doing was putting more money into my automatic savings at the top of the year. Um, I looked at my vacation days and figured out how many events I could do before leaving without dipping into not having enough vacation days. Um, I started buying equipment for my home office because a lot of times I would wait till I got to Ebony to print out things or scan things. I'm like, no, Jean, you should buy a printer scanner and a shredder. <laughs> Um, I also like cut out, I like, had a couple of subscription services that I just kind of was always like, I should, should cut off, but I never did. So I did that, but there weren't that many like money things I needed to do because I kind of live like below my means anyway. So mm-hmm. it was just more about putting more away and, um, making sure like not talking myself out of leaving Ebony. Cause I definitely had a couple of moments where, like, well, it's not time I should wait. Yeah. And then I'm like, you're never going to be ready. It's never, I mean, you're really ready, but you're never going to be completely set because you're going to be on your own, but you've been doing this for five years and it's time. Yeah. And the older you get, the more responsibilities you'll have. And then one day you'll have a family and have kids and you won't be able to go to Houston for a day party like this. So take the advantage now when you have this free time and you really don't have to worry about yourself to make your dreams come true. I hear that a lot as well. Like, um, is there, is there such a thing as a right time? Like, what would that even look like? No one, everyone says no, you know, like you, you have to choose that time. It's, there's never going to be a time that just pops up and you're like, okay, now. Um, I agree. I think you, but I think you do have to look at your finance, like be realistic. Like mm-hmm. if you're only, if you're a blogger that makes their money from doing sponsored posts and you're only getting like two sponsored posts a month that are like $200, then no, it's not time. But yeah maybe think about a job that will allow you to do your blog and do um, like like a, a part-time job and your blog so you can fulfill your dream, but also not be at that nine to five that maybe is draining you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like, let me clarify because I learned about team quit your job early, <laughs> early in 2008 when I quit my first job out of college. And, you know, I was on that, like, oh, I'm going to go to London and find myself. Like, I, I like felt good about myself because I submitted a Fulbright application. Fulbright was like, no. <laughs> and where did I go? Right to my parents' house. And, you know, that experience, which I've written about, really taught me that, OK, there are such things as horrible jobs, you know, and I, I haven't had a bad job like that since since I left in 08. But there are horrible bosses. There are horrible jobs. But no matter what, like nothing is as horrible as leaving somewhere with no backup plan and and no funds to support yourself and get to that next level and, and having to like scrap for a temporary solution and, and having that temporary solution last longer than you wanted it to. So I'm, I'm all about team, like get your cards and your ducks in a row before you make any type of leap as, as sexy as people think entrepreneurship is. So I agree with you on that for sure. Um, so have you had any mentors along the way, any people that you look up to who you're able to just run things by or you think or you've been learning a lot on your own self-education? Uh, blog wise, I haven't had like, well, like blog mentors that are in the space of blogging. Not really. Um, I've had like coffee with or lunch with a couple of well-known bloggers who have given me tips, but it's not on a regular basis. Mm-hmm. But I look at my cousin, Lisa, who is um, Lisa Jones. She's a famous screenwriter and author as a mentor because she's done it all. Like she's been the freelancer and has made a pretty good, a really good living being a creative person. She's the one that's always pushing me to like work really hard in your twenties, work really hard in your thirties because, or maybe early thirties, I guess, like, because when you, when that family comes, you won't have time. So I look at her and I run things by her and she's who I would lean to because even though my parents, my father's entrepreneur, it's a little different. Like people always have to get their taxes done, but I don't do clubs won't always be popular. So make sure that you're saving your money now and, and your muscle up beards money now. So when you decide to do something else, you're not going to be like, what did I do with all my money? Right. And speaking of money, like um, taxes, like how do you deal with that? Even if you've made a lot of money and, you know, a good portion of that is profit, then the tax man comes calling <laughs> and just steals all your hopes and dreams. How, how have you... Um, been working like putting aside or figuring out what percentage you need to put aside each month well the tax man definitely gave me a shock last year mm-hmm. so my dad always was asking me like you know how much money are you making you know are you, are you saving any and I was like yeah I am because I was always living below my means and I wasn't really touching the I don't do clubs money so you know I'll give you one number so I thought I made about 40,000 I don't do clubs I made more than that mm-hmm. so 
I was telling my dad, 40,000, 40,000, let's, you know, cl- and counting all the beard parties and blah, blah, blah. And then when I told him the actual number, he was like, oh, man, like, you have to pay X amount in taxes. Uh-huh. And I remember being really upset for, like, a week <laughs> because <laughs> yes. that nice little, you know, cushion I had to say was I could just look at, like, that was gone. And I don't own any property. So my dad was like, you, you know, you, you have to get married or have some kids or buy a house. Like, something has to happen <laughs> because you can't pay the this much money every year. So what we decided to do um, for this year was that every, I, I do quarterly taxes. Okay. So every um, like three to four months, I add up how much money I've made and I give, I save 15% or give 15% to the government through this like online portal. And if I overpay, which is probably what's going to happen, I get it back at the end of the year. Mm-hmm. So that way it's not a huge chunk at the end of the, at, in December or in January okay. being taken out of my savings. Got it. Got it. Um, cause yeah, I, you know, I've, I've only made a little bit as a freelancer and even that percentage off the little bit, I was like, no, <laughs> so good to know. Um, so talk about what's next for Janice and I don't do clubs and, and just your brand overall. What else are you planning? Okay. For Janice, um, a lot more travel and a lot more downtime. Another, another reason I decided to leave my full-time job was because I was feeling like I wasn't enjoying my success. Like, my friends are, like, more excited than, than me sometimes. They're like, well, you're not excited. Why aren't you excited? I'm like, because I have, like, a million things to do, and I can't stay out late because I need to go home and do X, Y, and Z. And I just was like, this is not the way to live. Like, you need to be able to hang out with your friends later or do things with your boyfriend without looking at the clock thinking, oh, I got to get home, I got to do this, or I got to get up early tomorrow because I didn't build the e-blast. So that was one of the reasons I decided to leave. So that personally, just more downtime and more travel and just kind of enjoying all that I've built. Mm-hmm. I'll do clubs, more beard parties because everyone seems to want them. So I want to go to new cities um, and not just a typical like Miami or Houston, like Indianapolis or, you know, somewhere in Kentucky where there's a strong black population that needs an event like this. I'm also working on a, an app. It's not it's kind of like a dating app, but not really. Um, which is playing off the slide in the DMs thing that I do on Instagram. And that's like the biggest um, project right now. And I'm also going to update the site probably later in the summer where it's going to have a whole new look and be automated because the submissions process does take a lot of time. And it, I don't necessarily have to have someone manning that. Like it should be able to be, you you click a couple of radio buttons for what your event is and then you hit send. Got it. And something I forgot to ask you was also, um, well, two things. So, you began the whole, you know, highlighting black owned businesses around the country. And that really took off. Like when you started black owned restaurant month, like that post just went viral on social. Um, what other plans do you have to build off of that? Um, well, um, black owned restaurant month, honestly, has been a little disappointing because the first time I did it, there was all this hype around it and, you know, I pushed it really hard. And then the second time I was like, okay, it's going to be easier because everyone's going to see the reach. And it wasn't really the case. A lot of restaurants don't check emails, don't respond to voicemails and um, just don't really see the value in I don't do clubs. And the first year I did it, I gave a lot of comps out because I'm like, okay, just, you know, try it out, see if it works for you. And of course those restaurants came back or most of them did, but a lot of restaurants didn't. So I would spend months, I actually spent like two or three months calling and reaching out to restaurants to get them to sign up and only a few signed up this year not it wasn't like double or triple what I expected so I've decided to reima- reimagine uh, restaurant month and I'm going to pair retail month which is actually starting next month but restaurant and retail month are going to come back in 2017 in February um, and I think that's easier because I don't want to not highlight restaurants that actually want to want to participate but at the same time I can't have the same restaurants every year got it um, the goal is just to expand it and hopefully people will begin to see the value in it. But a lot of like small businesses, as much as they love you when you're doing something for free, when you ask for a payment, everyone gets all nervous and they act like it's not that big of a thing. And I don't do clubs is, is priced very low considering its reach because I'm always concerned about getting a lot of restaurants to participate, a lot of businesses to participate because I want us to support black owned businesses without a month. Just like it should just be part of your day. Like, oh. There's a black owned I should go there instead of just going to the places around the corner. So um, those are my plans for expanding the black owned deal. Got it. And as you create these different branches of your business, 
What's your approach to trademarks and LLCs? Um, some people say, you know, don't worry about that until it's, it's, you know, taken off. And some people, they get caught up in like getting everything trademarked before they really take off the ground. So what's been your approach to that? Okay. Um, of course, I always knew I should trademark, I guess. Um, but like, you're not sure if the blog is going to blow up or if you want to spend that money. And um, I had a, a sore who, I have a sore friend who is a lawyer who sent me like the link to trademark it. Like, oh, just, you know, fill out the online form. And I put it off from, I don't know, maybe a year and a half because I just didn't really understand it and didn't want to do it wrong. And then I went to Forever 21 and <laughs> I was wasting time. And there was a shirt and I can't remember what it said, but it definitely had like a black phrase on it. Something that's like used on black Twitter. So I was like, do you see this mess? Like I, whoever friend I was with, I was yelling like, this is ridiculous. Like whatever black kid came up with this phrase, not going to see a penny of this. And that's how I was like, Janice, you need to get yourself in line. Because mm-hmm. people all love the name. I don't do clubs. So that day I went home and I trademarked it without any problem. Then a few months later, I tried to trademark uh, Muscle Beards. And I did something wrong in the form. And I, all these lawyers, or, you know, I guess lawyer type websites were contacting me about fixing it. But I was like, well, that might be a scam. I kept putting it off, putting it off. And then I had a meeting at a major publisher about bringing Muscle Beards to their festival. And the meeting's going great. And they're like, oh, yeah, um, it's trademarked, right? I was like, of course it's trademarked. Lying, because it wasn't trademarked. <laughs> so I ran home, and I called my best friend, who was a VP at a bank in Atlanta. And I was like, I need a lawyer. Took, like, Give me a lawyer. So I called his friend, who was a lawyer. And they went through it with me. And um, now, whenever I have an idea that I think is going to blow up, I just contact them. It can get a little pricey, because you know, you're know you hiring a lawyer to do the form. But it just... I sleep well at night because anyone could come in and and take your idea. And if you didn't protect it, then who do you have to blame? Mm. So So I would say maybe after a year or so, if your blog is still going strong and you really feel feel like it's something that you want to do for a few more years, then invest in it, invest in getting a lawyer and making sure it's done correctly. And it's a couple hundred dollars, but I mean, you'd be more upset if someone comes in like Forever 21 and starts putting your phrase on T-shirts. Right, right. That, and thank you for that, because I was just about to ask you, so what? at what stage should people be thinking about trademarking? All right, that's good to know. So you've given some great gems. I just have a few last questions. And one of those is, you know, what are your top three pieces of business advice for women side hustlers who are dreaming of one day working for themselves but don't really know where to start? I think the first step is just starting because I I know so many people that email me or friends that have these great ideas and it's years later and they still haven't started. Like starting is the hardest thing. Try not to think about all things that can go wrong and just things that can go right. It's really inexpensive to start a blog. It's really inexpensive to buy a URL. And that's another thing I want to bring up during the trademarking conversation. Maybe you don't buy the trademark right away because that is more expensive, but to buy a domain is like $15. So if you have an idea, buy the domain. And maybe you don't use it right away, but then it's yours and no one can take it. Um, Next, I would say is make sure that you're scheduling your personal time. Like being successful is great, but you also need like time for your friends and your family. And if you're, you know, have a man that too, like if not, you're going to get burnt out. And it's good to have people in your life that aren't necessarily in your space that can just help you relax. And then the last thing is um, don't be afraid to say no, because if you, if you don't say no, you're going to get caught doing things that you don't want to do. And then you're going to have yourself to blame if your goals aren't reached. So figure out a nice phrase that you, that, you, like, that is your standard response when you say no in an email or maybe, you know, in a, in a meeting. Because if not, people are going to, you know, keep asking you for things and you're going to look up and not have to build your goals. Right. And ignore is not the best uh, solution, right? <laughs> you you know, I mean, it. I try to respond to everyone, even if it's no. Mm-hmm. Because I don't want to lead anyone on. I think that's the worst thing. Like, if you know that you don't want to work with the person, just say, you know, I'm not interested in this partnership at this time. That mm-hmm. way the door is still kind of open if you change your mind. Mm-hmm. But I know with me, if you, like, give me the runaround for months, after a while I'm not going to even care. And I'm going to worry about what kind of business person you are. So just figure out a nice little way to say no or you're not interested. And another tip, which um, Joy from the Fab Empire gave me that same night, is you don't have to respond to emails as yourself. Get a fake person. Um, and you might need to do this too. But like <laughs> when the when the request rolling in and you don't want to be the bad person that's always saying no, yeah. have your assistant say no. And then you know when you have enough money to get a that's fine. But always saying I no also it. can drain you. Yeah. You know, because you feel bad and then you're you're spending all this time uh, trying to figure out a way to say no. And then some people are still not happy with that. They might say something smart to you and you don't want to get in the email war. 
with someone. So have your assistant say no. Got it. I love that. Um, so, okay, what's one question I should have asked you that I didn't? What didn't we touch on? Let's see. Um, well, the only thing I was going to bring up was the domain. That was the only thing I wanted to say about trademarking. Like, if you have an idea, if even if it's just an idea, buy the domain. And that way, even if you don't decide to build the blog or build the idea for months later, it's still yours. You'll own it. Mm-hmm. And go ahead and put on our renew. It's only $15. Um, <laughs> so you can make sure that your idea is protected. And then the next step would be trademarking and um, whatever else comes with that, getting an LLC, I guess. But make sure that the things that are free, you lock down first, like a domain. Well, not domain isn't free, but, you know, basically free. And then also the social media. Right. So invest in yourself, invest in ourselves and our ideas, like especially for $15. Like we spend more than that on lunch and meals in a day, probably some of us. Um, so definitely doable. So what's one final uh, thing you want to leave the audience with before we wrap this up? Sure. Um, I went to a networking panel a few weeks ago and my leak, who is the founder of Curlbox, was love the moderator. <laughs> oh, you said what? I said, I love her. Oh, no. I never, I mean, of course I follow her, but I, I didn't know her or anything like that. And she was talking about networking because it was a networking event. And she was saying that, you know, people need to learn to network on their level. And I thought that was so profound and so like true, because a lot of times I'll get people that have just started their blog or started their business like two months in and like, oh, we should partner. And it's like, no, because <laughs> there's nothing that, you know, you can do for me and maybe the things I can do for you. But why would I go out my way like that? Mm-hmm. In the meantime, you could partner with someone else that's probably near the same level as you and get the same exposure. And she said, like, you know, instead of trying to ask her for how you can work for Curlbox or how Curlbox can help you, look around this room and find someone that's at your same level. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really good. Like, don't waste your time, you know, trying to hound hound the biggest fashion blogger. Like, find someone who's new, too. Right. That you guys can build together. No, that's so true. And um, it's also about, like, not getting offended either offended either when that happens like understanding that maybe that person isn't ready for you yet or it's not the right time doing things in the meantime to build up and being able to come back at the appropriate time and say hey you know would you be interested i've done x y and z and it would be if i you know i thought it would be a good fit for us blah 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 seats come with you know Real ideas. I, I was on a, a marketing, I was on a panel for a marketing summit yesterday. And one thing I was trying to drive home is, you know, a partnership is equal parts. Mm-hmm. You can't come to a brand and just say, well, I want all these things. And when the brand comes back and says, well, how is it a partnership? You don't have an answer. Like think mm-hmm. of ways that both people can benefit because if not, you're probably never going to partner with anyone. Right. Like it can't be one-sided. It's so true. And, and I appreciate my leak for that. Um, I follow her. I listen to her podcast also. And at first I was like, oh, who is this woman? <laughs> but she really she she tells it like it is. And um, it's definitely um, nuggets of wisdom that I've been taking to heart. So how do you avoid uh, now I said I said last question, but really, here's another one. Speaking of that, um, how do you navigate like not being the bitch like you, when you have to really give people hard stinging words like that like you know what this might not be a good opportunity or maybe you don't tell them that but you know there are people who probably think you're a bitch because you are like oh this is not a good opportunity like i don't think it's mutually beneficial you know i've had i've had to get over that because the first few years like i said i spent a lot of time saying yes to everyone and not you know reaching my own goal so i can't worry about if you think i'm a bitch like the end goal is making sure I don't do clubs does well so that my family and I can do well. So I've kind of gotten over that. But what I try to do is keep my answers sw- so- short and sweet, not get into back and forth because that's when it becomes personal. So like, even when someone tries to take a jab at me, I usually just, you know, don't even respond. Like I gave you my answer. My answer is, you know, no, thank you. Not at this time. Thank you for your interest. But we you know I'm not interested in any additional partnerships at this time and keep it moving. Um, you just really have to get over that. You have to get thick skin. Cause if not, you're going to be doing, Everyone a favor and not yourself one. Got it. And that concludes our first ever interview on Side Hustle Pro. Big shout out to Janice Jamila for stopping by. She's a friend of the show, friend of mine, and I'm really happy that she was able to impart her words of wisdom with us. If you want to hear more from Janice, you can find her at I don't do clubs dot com and also on social media um, everywhere at I don't do clubs. 
Hey guys, thanks for listening to Side Hustle Pro. If you want to hear more from me, head on over to sidehustlepro.co forward slash side hustle corner to get my weekly side hustle diaries chronicles about my own journey from passion project to profitable business. And if you want to find me online, I'm at Side Hustle Pro on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Don't forget to join the Side Hustle Pro Facebook community. Go to sidehustlepro.co forward slash mastermind. Mine. And as always, if you love the show, do me a favor and subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes. Thanks, guys. Talk to you next week.